Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to the book of Acts. Tonight we continue in Acts chapter 15, looking, the Lord willing, at verses 30 through 33. The message tonight entitled, Fellowship, Confirmation of Unity. We looked two weeks ago at witness, confirmation of sound doctrine, and now we have fellowship, confirmation of unity. Tonight we're in Acts chapter 15, verses 30 through 33. Before we begin, let's open in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the grace of God, the incredible love of God, the extension of that love to us as sinful human beings, and how we thank you that because of your love, we are able to have love for you as a responsive love, and love for one another as an obedient love. Father, we pray for your blessings on the going forth of your word tonight, that it would not return void, but that it would accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Two weeks ago, witness confirmation in sound doctrine. Last week, guest speaker Dan Waite was with us while I was at Amana's graduation from medical school. So we'll do a very quick review of our context here, beginning back in verse 19. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, and from fornication, and from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Now that was the message dealing with avoiding stumbling blocks, and you recall that the context of this entire chapter is a challenge to the doctrines of grace and faith. The local issue at the time was circumcision and the law of Moses, but the bigger issues were the challenge to law, uh, excuse, the challenge by law uh, and works to grace and faith. Then continuing on, as we saw, we saw that the principles applied both to Jewish and pagan apostate and heretical means of salvation and sanctification. We noted that Christians often do things that cause other Christians to stumble in their Christian life. And so we always need to ask if we are going to be consistent in our Christian walk, how is my life affecting the lives of those around me? How is it affecting my testimony for Christ in an unsaved world? And how is it affecting my testimony to weaker brothers who may stumble as a result of the things which I choose to do. There may be things that are neither moral nor immoral, and there's a special word for that. Who remembers the special word for that? I've told you many times, I hope you learn this word eventually. Uh, ah, we had one over here, adiaphorus, adiaphorus, I was gonna say, ah, so that's the way it is, but adiaphorus, adiaphorus things that are neither moral in and of themselves nor immoral in and of themselves. If there were no context, they would not be either moral nor immoral. But as we've seen, everything has a context in the real world. And so the mature Christian must be willing to give up those things that he might consider his rights for the sake of the testimony of Christ, either to the unsaved world around him or his testimony to that weaker brother whom he's trying to help mature in his faith. We looked at many key passages related to stumbling blocks. We saw that there were certain things that always will be a stumbling block. The written word and the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ. People stumble over Christ. We must simply be faithful in presenting him. Usually we're willing to compromise on that when we're not willing to compromise and give up, quote, rights that we think we have. We're willing to soft pedal the gospel instead. But no, the things that we should never give up relate to who Jesus is and what he did and the word of God. On the other hand, there are other things that should never be allowed as stumbling blocks. And we've seen many of them in the contexts of Romans chapter 14, 1 John chapter 2, 1 Corinthians 8, and Revelation chapter 2. Then last time together, we looked at witness, confirmation, and sound doctrine. So we continue in verse 22. Then pleased that the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barnabas, 
and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. Forasmuch as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying, Ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. And you know, uh, I have run across multiple people in the six and a half years that we have been here that claim the authority of having been from Bible Presbyterian Church under the teaching of Dr. Carl McIntyre, but after you listen to them for a while, you begin to realize they're not teaching either what Carl McIntyre taught or what the Bible taught. And yet they are claiming that kind of an authority, and apparently these people uh, had claimed we have authority. We're from the church at Jerusalem. We've gotten it from the horse's mouth. We've heard it from Peter and John and James and all the others there at Jerusalem. He says they went out from us. John makes reference to that too. He says there are some who went out from us, but they were not of us over in 1 John. Troubling your soul, saying, You must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. And so they are claiming that this is directly related to the work of the Holy Spirit during that apostolic period whereby new special revelation was being given. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us that you abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication from which if you keep yourselves you shall do well, fare ye well. And we saw that that sentence of James is clarified here. Pollution of idols is clarified as meat offered to idols, which is specifically discussed by Paul, as we've already seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And so as we looked at Acts 15 and the church there, certifying the principles established by God in the Old Testament, we saw that they fulfilled the requirement that God himself follows, which is, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. And we looked at about 20 different passages, both in the Old Testament and in the Gospels and in the Epistles, which restate that passage in multiple different situations. It's laid out first in Numbers and Deuteronomy, and then it's given as an illustration in Joshua and Ruth. It's given in Isaiah. We see Jesus speaking of it in Matthew 18, Matthew chapter 26. We see the apostles using it in Acts chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 5. We find it referenced in 2 Corinthians 3, 1 Timothy 5, Hebrews 10, Hebrews 12, and Revelation 11. That should give us the idea that God means in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word will be established. Very important in all cases and all matters of church discipline so that you do not have false testimony being brought against someone out of a vendetta against them. Now tonight, we have fellowship, confirmation, and unity. So that brings us down to verse 30. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. And after they had tarried there a space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. Now we find some very important principles given to us in this short passage of scripture. It, at first glance, perhaps doesn't seem to contain many things. It's they got home, everybody was happy, they stayed a while and then they went. Well, there's a lot more to it if you look at it carefully in its context. The key issues are given here in verse 30 for church unity. The first thing we discover is that they had submission to an authority from the principal authority figures. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch. Those who were at the church council in Jerusalem, those who were the principal authority figures, not only gave them their approval, but gave them dismissal to carry an epistle back to the church at Antioch. The second thing we learn are there are five levels of communication involved in this passage here. First, there is leadership communication. That's very important. If there is a 
a, a mist in the pulpit, as one of my professors used to say, if there's a mist in the pulpit, there will be a major fog in the pews. <laughs> you don't want that. There is leadership communication as to what should be done. The second thing we find is it is open communication. We find that when they come to the church at Antioch, that they are able to verbally tell the church at Antioch exactly what the apostles said. It's going to be a clear communication. You cannot have a garbled message as you get it to your destination. You've all played the telephone game where kids sit around in a circle and one person whispers something in the first person's ear and the second person whispers what he thinks he heard in the next person's ear and by the time it gets around the circle there are some gaps and there are some odd things that are in that particular communication. You need to make sure that there is clear communication. The next thing we learn is that it was public communication. You look at the situation, it says they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle. And finally, it was a written communication. It left a permanent legacy as to what was to be done. It was not merely oral, although oral was included in it. It was also a written communication to make sure that there was a written legacy that was left behind. As you look over church history, the men who have made the greatest impact in church history have not merely been great preachers, they have also been great writers. The men who have left a permanent legacy dating back hundreds and even more than 1,000 years back to the days of the apostles and their disciples are men who left written communication so that we know precisely what was happening at various points in church history, what the doctrinal disputes were, what the solutions were, what the problems were and how they were handled. We can look back because we have a written record. The second area that we see here is the results that occur in a local church when this form is taking place. First, the submission and approval to the principal authority figures. Second, the five levels of communication. What kind of results can you expect in the local church? The first thing we discover is doctrinal stability. All the bad stuff has gotten cut away and all the good stuff has gotten confirmed. You have doctrinal stability. The church is no longer questioning. The church is no longer wondering what they should believe and how will it affect their practical life. Because, of course, the false doctrine is not merely false doctrine. It was affecting the practical life of the believers at Antioch. The second thing is we discover is that produces practical unity. Doctrinal stability produces practical unity in the church. <clears throat> now, you remember, tonight our message is entitled Fellowship, Confirmation of Unity. And so we see here the church gathered together and now in a relaxed mode able to say we no longer have a fight in the congregation because the doctrine has been established. The third thing we discover, and very beautifully so, is there is a manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit. It says which when they had read they rejoiced for the consolation. There is joy, there is comfort, there is peace in the church. And as we will see, there is also a great deal of love among the brethren. Those are the first three fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, and peace. So we find love between the brethren, joy among the brethren, peace between the brethren. Next we find the exercise of the spiritual gifts. This has opened the door for a few further exercise of the gifts. Did you notice verse 32? Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. We have a further exercise of the spiritual gifts of prophecy and of the gift of exhortation for the brethren. And now those of you who are with us, when we went through the study of the spiritual gifts, know that the gift of prophecy was only for the apostolic period, but the gift of exhortation is one of the permanent gifts which we are supposed to be exercising one with another based on doctrinal truth and practical unity. The third thing, or excuse me, the fifth thing that we discover is there is a unity of co-leadership. There's a dual confirmation of the message being brought here. 
And that takes us back to the principle we already studied in the mouth of two or three witnesses. So we have two men here who are bearing witness, Judas and Silas. Leadership is bearing witness together. There is unity with two or three witnesses. The further thing we see here is there is a confirmation and stability of the local church. They are building into the church with greater doctrine. Did you see the last principle of that verse? Uh, the last words of that verse. It says, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. Everybody settled down. Everybody has, has now been gotten their blocks in the right spot and the concrete has been laid. The church is being built as they exercise their gifts here. We find something else that's very interesting. We find that these two leaders who had made that big long trip to Jerusalem and now have come back, there is a time of rest for ministry leaders. Friends, I can certify that as a necessity, a time of ministry rest for those who are in positions of leadership. We don't know how long that was. It doesn't seem to have been a very long time. It just says after they had tarried there a space. <laughs> now that, that can be taken many different ways. Was it a big space, a middle-sized space, a long space? How long a time were they there? They were there obviously for some period of time and they had time for ministry rest. And then we find finally, there was edification, fellowship, and another release for expanded ministry. After they had tarried their space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. So we have a give and take between what we would call the mother church and some of the daughter churches, and we have them going back, and this is very interesting, it says back to the apostles. They're released to go back to the apostles. Now we're going to see some other interesting things in the text that follows this, but it implies that perhaps there is also opportunity for further training. Now one's going to go and one's going to stay, but there is a release. There is the opportunity, if wanted, for further fellowship with the apostles, those who are the primary teachers. Now the things that we discover here in this text, where we see the doctrinal stability, the practical unity, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, and peace, really is based on the teaching of Christ. He had laid the foundation for what is taking place here in this particular passage. The external proof of salvation, listen carefully, the external proof of salvation and of a having a relationship to Christ is love. We find it referenced 22 times in the Gospel of John. The proof of salvation and relationship to Christ is love. You know, the proof of having a proper relationship with brethren in the church is love. And you know, the proof of having a proper relationship in marriage is love. We're going to discover that each of the things that we find in the unity of the church here goes back to something that Jesus taught that relates not merely to the church, but also relates to the marriage relationship. Let me give you some of the verses. John chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. It's not an open-ended commandment to love. It's a commandment that has an example in which you are to follow. Love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Verse 35 of John 13, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Remember what I said, external proof of salvation and your relationship to Christ is the way that you express love for the brethren. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. We see that going on here in the book of Acts. We see the church being unified. We see the expressions of love and unity and peace and joy. 1 John chapter 3, we see it again. We know, not we guess, not we hope, we know that we have passed from death unto life because it's the external proof and it is an internal confirmation if 
We have love for the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. To the external world, you prove that you're a Christian by the way that you love other believers. It's one of the three tests of a true Christian over in 1 John. We'll be getting to 1 John in a few moments. But one of the three tests that John gives to us that is an external proof that you are truly saved. One of those is love for the brethren. And the way in which we confirm it to ourselves at, that we are saved, one of those tests is we know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. 1 John 4, 7, we move on, on a chapter. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth, and in context, that loves his brother, every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. That is one of the tests to know whether or not you're truly saved, is whether or not you love the brethren in the same way that Christ loved you. Sometimes that should bear some soul searching for us. We think that because we've done the externals, we think that because we've walked the aisle, because we've prayed the sinner's prayer, because we've tried to follow the Ten Commandments or some other thing out there, that therefore we must be saved. A man who's truly saved will have a life that is changed. You remember the question that I often ask people? So you say, say you're saved. How? Has it changed your life? The Holy Spirit takes you as you are, but he does not leave you as you are. And one of the transformations that God works in the life of the believer is what we see going on in the church at Antioch here in Acts chapter 13. 15, excuse me. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. And just in case you missed it, the very next verse says, He that loveth not, and that context is loving the brethren, He that loveth not, knoweth not God. For God is love. Four verses down, verse 12, No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Now, we don't all love each other perfectly. We know that. We're still sinful human beings. But as you begin to express that love one for another in practical ways, and we'll see some of the practical ways in a moment, as you begin to express that love one for another, it says your, the love is perfected in you. That love is being brought to a point of maturity. It begins to grow deeper. It begins to grow richer. It begins to grow fuller. It begins to become more practical. You begin to think of greater ways in which you can exercise that love for the brethren. Verse 16, four verses later. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Not only is it going to be perfected, not only is it going to be getting more and more mature, verse 12, but four verses later, it is going to abide, it's going to dwell, it's going to be a constant state of being in the one who is a mature Christian. Very important. It's one of the key issues in 1 John. Love of the brethren, the morally pure godly lifestyle, sound doctrine concerning the person and work of Christ, three tests that John gives to us, one doctrinal, two practical, to know whether or not you are truly saved. Chapter 5, verse 2. By this we know, not we guess, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God, and, here's part 2, and keep his commandments. Genuine love is going to result in obedience to Christ. Now, what is true obedience to Christ? You know how we define that in the New Testament. That's discipleship. You claim to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you want to be his disciple? John gives us that. By this we know we love the children of God when we love God and keep his 
commandments. Genuine love for Christ results in obedience to Christ, true discipleship. Jesus said that. This is not just 1 John. This is not just John making it up out of the blue after he's thought about it theologically for a while and decided to put things together. This are the specific words of Christ in the Upper Room Discourse in John chapter 14. John 14, 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Jesus says, if you really love me, what are you going to do? You're going to obey me. If you really love me, you're going to do what I told you to do. If you really love me, you're not going to just say you love me. You're going to be obedient. Very important proof of love, as we'll see in just a few moments. How about verse 21? He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Did you see the things that are connected to obedience? You say that you love, okay, if you say that you love, then obey me. If you love me, keep my words. And you know there's going to be a marvelous result. He says, my Father will love him. Number two, and we will come unto him. And number three, we will make our abode with him. When you truly believe on Jesus, it will change your life and it will change the way in which you walk in your relationship with God. How about down to verse 23, a few verses farther. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. Now, you know, the same is true in a marriage relationship between a husband and wife, because that, that reflects the relationship between Christ and his bride, the church. The first point that we make in relation to marriage tonight is that the wife proves that she loves her husband when she obeys and submits to her husband. You heard me preach my daughter's, uh, this is a funeral, no, her wedding uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, the passage that we chose was out of Ephesians chapter 5. And the husband has all kinds of responsibilities. The wife basically has one responsibility, to obey and to submit to her husband. And many wives say, well, my husband doesn't love me as Christ loves the church. doesn't matter. That's still the way God has laid it out to be. The husband's going to be held much more accountable than the wife will be held accountable. And the husband is supposed to love his wife as Christ loves the church and gave himself for it. But the wife's responsibility, simple but not easy, is to obey and to submit to her husband. And we find that is being expressed here because Jesus is the heavenly bridegroom and we are his bride. There are many other passages. For example, 1 John 2, 5. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. There's that business of obedience again to prove that you love him and to prove that you are in him. How about chapter 3, verse 11? For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. That's a command. It's not an option. Verse 23, excuse me, and this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Did you ever realize how many verses there are that related to that command that Jesus gave to us? To love one another. That's to the body of Christ. That's to the Christians. That's to those who claim that they've believed, that they love one another. How about chapter 4, verse 21? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. You say you love God? Well, hey, you have no other options. Love your brother also. Chapter 5, verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Too many people say, oh, man, do I really have to obey God? What a drag. What an awful life. I don't, it's going to be dull. It's going to be dull. You know what? If you really understand God's love for you and the fact that every one of his commandments is designed for your good as an expression of his love. And when we obey it, we get the greatest amount of joy and peace. Then his commandments are not grievous because they are designed 
for our good as well as for his glory. That brings us to point number three. Genuine love for Christ results in perseverance. Genuine love for Christ results in perseverance. And you know that's what we see happening in the book of Acts. You look at the Apostle Peter in the book of Acts. You look at the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. They were running into opposition every place they turned. The Apostle Paul makes some reference back to that in his epistles as to all the different things he went through. I mean, we've already seen the Apostle Paul going through you know, a horrible stoning incident. And he talks about being shipwrecked in the night and the day and the deep and being beaten with rods and being beaten with whips. I mean, he was betrayed multiple times. He had false brethren. He was betrayed by Jews. He was betrayed by Gentiles. He had all kinds of problems. But remember we talked about Paul being God's bulldog? Perseverance. Genuine love for Christ results in perseverance, which is true discipleship, as we see in Acts. Look at John chapter 15, verses 9 and 10. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Genuine love results in perseverance. You know, the same is true in marriage, isn't it? Perseverance in marriage, where you are willing to stick it out even when difficult times come. Now, sometimes it just seems awful. Sometimes it seems like just, you know, you're right on the verge of having a, a breakup. Sometimes it seems like you're so mad you never want to talk to that other person. Sometimes you think the other person is so apathetic that there's no possibility that this thing can continue. Does the Lord Jesus Christ ever give up on us? Or are you eternally secure? There are a lot of principles here as we discuss the love for the brethren that we can also see should be reflected in a proper relationship between husband and wife. That's true, this perseverance in marriage because the relationship between husband and wife ref reflects the relationship between Christ and his bride, the church. Point four, genuine love of the brethren is non-optional. Genuine love of the brethren is non-optional. John 15, 12 and John 15, 17. This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. Did you get it? This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. Not love one another in some other way. Love one another as I have loved you. Verse 17. These things I command you that ye love one another. Now, as you look over the lives of the apostles, I hope you get the sense that those guys didn't always get along with one another. They're always squabbling about some petty issue and Jesus is walking ahead and they're back there at the back and a couple of them are probably trailing behind arguing about some particular issue. And we know on one occasion they were arguing about who was going to be greatest when Jesus set up his kingdom. <laughs> Jesus had to teach them a little lesson about that, didn't he? By taking a little child, setting him in the midst of them and saying, the greatest among you is going to be like a little child. That's what's greatness. Don't be like the Gentiles. Don't be like those kings who set themselves up in authority and like to boss people around. That's not greatness. As you love one another, you will show greatness. And you know the same is true in marriage, particularly for the husband, because the husband is commanded. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. He gives a command to the husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. It's parallel. As Christ loved the church. Man, that's a big, a big order. I tell you, I was married to Judy for 40 years, and what a blessed time that was. And each of us, on various occasions, struggled with the responsibilities that God had given to us, her to be in submission and obedience to me, because I'm a rather ornery old rascal and me to love her as Christ loved the church because she was not all always roses and light. 
but you know it's a command. And that is the goal to express and visibly portray to the world around us what the relationship is like between Christ and his bride, the church. The fifth point, genuine love for the brethren is sacrificial. Genuine love for the brethren is sacrificial. John 15, 13. Again, we're in the middle of the Upper Room Discourse here, the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. John chapters 14, 15, and 16 are the Upper Room Discourse. Jesus says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's the greatest form of love. Genuine love is sacrificial. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, John picks up that theme, and in fact, he spends three verses on it, verses 16, 17, and 18. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? You say, okay, yeah, yeah, it hasn't come to that yet, and so I'm not worried about that, but I'll, I'll claim right now that sure, I'd, love, I'd lay down my life for the brethren. John says, okay, if, that, if you really mean that, let's see if something a little less than laying down your life is also in the ballpark. You see a brother or sister that has a need. How does the love of God dwell in you if you don't meet the need? I mean... Helping a brother or sister out who has a need is a whole lot less than laying down your life, the great heroic act. You know, jumping in front of the train and shoving, you know, the heroin out of the way while you take the bullet, you know. Everybody likes to think of those heroic kind of things. Most of us wouldn't do it if the time came. But John says, well, there's a very easy way to test whether or not you have that kind of love for the brethren where you lay down your life for the brethren. And that is... Whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? And then a little exhortation in verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. If you don't do it, it's not true. You can babble with your gums, batting back and forth all you want, but if you don't do it, it's not true. Genuine love for the brethren is sacrificial, and of course the same is true in marriage. I didn't finish reading that phrase out of uh, Ephesians a moment ago. I read just the first part, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Last part of the phrase, And gave himself for it. Genuine love is sacrificial. Sixth, genuine love for the brethren is a reflection of love that exists between the members of the Trinity. Genuine love for the brethren is a reflection of love that exists between members of the Trinity. Jesus in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17 verse 26 says, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Genuine love of the brethren is a manifestation of the love that exists between members of the Trinity. Father, in the same way that you loved me, my prayer for them is that they will love one another with the same kind of love with which you loved me, that it may also be in them. First John chapter 4, verse 9 implies the same. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Next verse, here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God's love acted, God's love must be reflected. 
Beloved, if God so loved us, verse 11, next verse, we ought also to love one another. The love that the members of the Trinity have one for another should be reflected in the love that we have for one another. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Number seven, although our love for Christ is weak, and I think that all of us would admit that, although our love for Christ is weak and our love often falters and fails, amazingly, he loves us enough that he still has service for us to do. Now we want our love to grow stronger. And as we love the brethren, it does grow stronger. As we love the brethren, it does reflect Christ better. As we love the brethren, our love is perfected. But as we look at our love, it's probably pretty weak compared with the love that God has for us. Jesus told Peter that in John chapter 21, verse 15. Peter's love had been weak, it faltered, but Jesus still had service for Peter to do. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Now you know Peter is waffling here. You've heard me preach messages on this. Probably heard a bunch of other preachers preach messages on it of the different uses of the word love. But even though Peter responds with this paltry, weak, feeble response, Jesus still gives him a job to do. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? Do you even have a human love for me? Teleo. And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Love for God and the brethren is exclusive, just as it is in marriage. 1 John 2.15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Either you love the world or you love God. They're exclusive. It's like marriage. Either you love your wife or you love somebody else or you love something else more than your wife or your husband. The love for God and the brethren is an exclusive love just as in marriage. Love for God is life-changing just as in marriage as well. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. We're his reflection in the world. It's life changing. It gives you a boldness when you have a genuine love for Christ. You're not afraid to tell other people about him. You know, I was always talking about Judy. <laughs> Every time I got together with anybody, I talked about Judy and talked about my kids. Why? Because I love them. I love them. It gives you boldness. Verse 18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Love for God is life-changing. What does it do? It gets rid of fear out of your life. Verse 20, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Love for God is life-changing. It changes how you deal with your brethren. If you say, I love God, but you hate your brother, it's proof that your life has not been changed. Next, love for God is responsive, just as in marriage. 1 John 4.19 We love him because he first loved us. Well, we're running out of time here. I've got a whole lot more to this message, but I know that our DVD is about to run out, only had 48 minutes left on it. We're also going to see that this is based on the teaching of the apostles. It's also based on the Great Commission in Acts chapter 1 commission. It gives us a new cycle for further training and experience for expanded ministry. But those are sections that we'll have to take up next week, the Lord willing. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. 
We pray for your blessings on the word as it has gone forth tonight, that you will teach us to love one another, to have a transformational experience like we see taking place here in Acts chapter 15. When the doctrinal issues were settled, when the fellowship was established, when the unity was established, when leadership followed its proper role and when those under leadership followed their proper role, there was an expansion ministry of the gospel. There was peace in the church. There was the fruit of the Spirit. There was the exercise of the spiritual gifts. There was an incredible outpouring of your work in Antioch because things were going the way that you designed for them to go because they'd learned to love one another. Father, we pray that you would teach us to love one another, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.